tonight on The Readout. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. William Russell, a White House aide who was at Trump's side just before he delivered those remarks on January 6th, meets again with the grand jury as special counsel Jack Smith's criminal investigation enters its final stages. Also tonight, the summer that American labor took a stand, Hollywood actors and writers are on strike, and flight attendants and UPS workers could be next. Plus, the culture war battles the right is choosing to fight, backing a music video that promotes gun violence and attacking, I am not making this up, Barbie. <laughs> I'm Jason Johnson in for Joy Reid, and we begin tonight with just a few hours left in the day. Donald Trump says is the deadline set by special counsel Jack Smith for the twice impeached, twice indicted former president to appear before the grand jury investigating his alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election. At least that's, that's what he told us. It was in the target letter that he received over the weekend. But as far as we can tell, Trump has remained at his New Jersey golf club. But that should be no surprise. Today, the grand jury did hear from a former White House aide who now works for Trump's 2024 campaign. William Russell was with Trump for much of the day on January 6th. You can see him there on the ellipse beside Trump before the former president addressed the crowd. It is not Russell's first time appearing before the grand jury, begging the question why he was asked to return. Making it all the more interesting is the fact that Russell was never interviewed by the January 6th House Committee last summer. Remember that committee interviewed like more than a thousand people, but somehow Russell was not on that list and his name wasn't even mentioned in the committee's final report. There are still a lot of other questions surrounding this case, including when or if Trump will be indicted and if he is, what's he going to get charged with? What we know at this point are there are three key statutes mentioned in the target letter that could guide charges against Trump. There are also the questions surrounding all the others involved in the efforts to try and overturn the election, who might be cooperating with the special counsel, and who else could find themselves facing charges. This is a lot. So I have a fantastic panel to start off tonight. Joining me now is Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney, University of Alabama professor, and MSNBC legal analyst. Michael Steele, former RNC chair, MSNBC political analyst, and host of the Man of Steel podcast. And Brian Tyler Cohen, host of the No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen podcast and an MSNBC contributor. Thank you all so much for starting us off. We have a lot to talk about tonight. Joyce, I'll start with this. Um, I, like most of America, was riveted last summer by the January 6th hearings. It was one of the most highest rated things on TV, and I'm not being glib when I say that. It was amazing to see that kind of civic engagement from people across the United States. It is amazing to me that this William Russell guy was not included in anything last year, but Jack Smith has found them. Just from a legal standpoint, I, I mean, is, 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 is he crossing a T and dotting an I we haven't seen before? Is there something that Jack Smith might have gotten access to that the January 6th committee couldn't? I'm just curious as to what the significance of this is from a legal standpoint, because I'm surprised that this guy was overlooked. Well, we don't know for a fact that he was overlooked, Jason. It's really a curious situation. But federal prosecutors have a power that others don't. They have the subpoena power. And that means that throughout this process, Jack Smith has been able to obtain testimony from people he wants to hear from and that the January 6th committee may not have had success with. It's very likely that along the way, prosecutors were doing as they do, asking who was there, what was said, and in the course of eliciting that information almost by rote, repeatedly with witnesses, this name may have surfaced as someone that they need to talk to. The reporting is that he was at Trump's side throughout that day. And something that prosecutors will be looking for are casual comments made by the president in the course of the day. Did he acknowledge being aware that he had lost the election? Did he perhaps say that he was happy to see violence, that he hoped violence would help him hang on to the presidency? Lots of value in a witness like this if, and it's a big one here, because he's represented by lawyers representing other people in Trump's inner circle. But if he will tell the truth, prosecutors could learn a lot of interesting information. Michael Steele, you know, the more people who end up getting caught in this web, the more I think to myself, if I am a self-serving elected official, if I am a, a Republican, I am at least coming up with a plan B, right? Plan A is stay loyal to mm -hmm. Trump 
attach yourself to him like a barnacle. If he goes down, maybe you jump off at the last minute. But smart people have a plan B. You don't stay in politics 20, 30, 40 years without having a plan B. What is the plan B right now behind the scenes for Republicans if this goes left? If one of these three massive investigations against President Trump ends up convicting him and it's a really ugly charge, worse than anything we've seen before, what's the plan B behind the scenes? Well, the plan B is that... Uh... <laughs> That's about it. Plan B, yeah. B for bounce? I'm a bounce? I mean, I'm, I'm going to just be out? I just gave you plan B. We out. Drop the mic. Now, you look, the, the, the bet is on Trump. The bet has always been on Trump. Um, you know, the, the plan B started with, with DeSantis, but that plan B was, was developed and put in, put in motion not by the base, but by the, the moneyed interest in the party, the, the, the high-end billion-dollar donors, the establishment that the, that the base, quite frankly, has a beef with. Right, they they are the reason they tacked to Trump back in 2016. So now, for them to have a plan B that you think this base is going to go, okay, they got our guy, our Messiah, right, our Moses, our, the the man who's led us to the promised land, that they're just going to go, all right, we're just going to buy into your plan B. That's not how this is going to play out. The this is this is ride or die for a lot of these folks which is why you see the level of commitment that you have from the base. Yeah, you've got some of the principals now talking, but what are they actually saying? And are they are they more Weisselberg than they are Cohen, right? Are they are they going to, you know, go down for Trump or are they going to give up the goods on Trump? And so my bet is you're going to have less giving up of those goods by these individuals uh, and more going down with Trump, which means that the party's got to roll in that direction and deal with the outcome should this thing come to a head before November of 2024, which a lot of us doubt it fully will. Um, right. and, and quite honestly, that's a big bet uh, that the Trump team is making. Um, and you, we're all watching uh, Judge Eileen in, in Florida, for uh, Cannon in Florida, for example. So there's a lot, a lot of road that gives these rooms, uh, these folks room not to necessarily have to go to a plan B because plan A is working out so swimmingly. <laughs> Brian, so this is the thing that always gets me about this. We have these highfalutin conversations, right? We talk about, okay, indictments and Jack Smith and everything else like that. I'm a college professor at Morgan State University. When I talk to 18, 19 year olds who live their entire lives on Instagram and TikTok, only some of this trickles down. I, I am fairly confident if I talk to a lot of Zoomers and young millennials I know, they don't even know who Jack Smith is. This is kind of your bailiwick. How much of this trickles down, right? How much of these sort of week in, week out details about these investigations are trickling down? And how's it being consumed by sort of younger viewers and Zoomers and things like that? Yeah, I think I think the younger generations have a much higher proclivity to actually engage with this stuff than before. I mean, just with social media unto itself, we're right. able to consume so much more than we used to. I mean, how many kids when when even I was in school were like picking up the newspaper to, to figure <laughs> out what happened? But th this stuff also impacts us. I mean, to claim that politics doesn't have a massive impact in our lives with everything happening with abortion, with these don't say gay laws, with these LGBT bans, with interstate travel bans that are happening across right. the, that, that are happening in certain states. I mean, to, to claim that these things don't have a massive impact on young people's lives is just defying reality. And, and, and here's the thing. I also think that you can get more interaction now. Right. Like there was a time where it's like, hey, you know. I'm going to write my congressman, and maybe he or she will write me back. But if I can scream at somebody directly on Twitter, or what's left of Twitter, uh, or TikTok, there's yeah. actually a lot more interaction that, that a young voter can get today than in the past. Yeah, they, they don't seem so, I guess, it doesn't seem like such a nebulous concept as it used to in the past. And a lot of these especially younger Democratic congresspeople and senators are very happy to engage and happy to, to interact with their constituents and just people online. I mean, they, they are... I guess that's the difference between what it used to be, is a lot of them are younger anyway, and they've right. grown up in this age of, of millennials and Gen Zs, and so, uh, and so this is just the new normal. Like, it shouldn't be this club, this elitist club, where they don't have any interaction with people, because, you know, we're, at the end of the day, we're the people that have all the power. Right, and the ones voting for them. It's funny, I remember back in my, my young intern days when it was like literally trying to get members of Congress to get emails was difficult. Uh, with that in mind, I want to play a little sound, Joyce, um, about what is actually going on 
with some of the other people who are heavily involved in this process, right? So we have, uh, you know, we have William Russell. We're also finding out things about Mark Meadows. So I want to play this sound from George Conway on Meadows. Get your thoughts on the other side. I also think that the last possibility to me has always been the most intriguing, which is there are people, are there people who are cooperating? We've seen some very strange quietness from, for example, Mark Meadows. I mean, he, I, I just have the feeling something's going on there. I mean, he's someone who ought to be every bit as exposed as Donald Trump, yet he's been so quiet and they're just, yeah. it just seems like there's something up with him. Joyce, I don't know if silence means guilt. I don't know if silence means he's trying to line up his life for a long time in jail in a jumpsuit. I don't know. But is there something to this? Is there something to the fact that one of the main conspirators, right, somebody who was intimately involved in the process, at least legally, of trying to overthrow the 2020 election, that he hasn't been on the talk circuit, that we haven't heard that much about him? We know he's testified, but other than that, he's been kind of quiet. He's been awfully quiet, and I think George is an astute observer here. Look, Mark Meadows is someone who, in some ways, makes his um, living by promoting himself and his, his work, his book on, on television. It's surprising to have seen him go to radio silence. That's something that we often see with people who've struck a cooperation deal with the government. That's not the only conclusion that we could reach here. He could simply be trying to keep himself out of it with a low profile knowing he does have considerable exposure. But the reality is that Mark Meadows was in the mix. He appeared to be the gatekeeper and the coordinator for much of the planning that went on in advance of January 6th. He would be a possible target or at least a subject of the government's uh, investigation. And if he has, in fact, agreed to cooperate with the government, he, too, would offer very high value. He's probably the most important cooperator that the government would be able to land because of his access and not only his conversations with the former president, but his constant text messaging with all sorts of people, including a lot of the lawyers who've been identified as part of the fake slates of electors planning and the efforts to use the Justice Department to uh, perpetuate the uh, big lie and the, the notion that there was fraud in the election when there wasn't. So it's a very interesting absence from the public square with Mark Meadows. It's interesting that we are living in a day and age where a president could be taken down by text messages and DMs. My distinguished panel is sticking around because there's still a lot to discuss about Trump's potentially looming indictment. 